Hi friends, my name is Benjamin, and today I want to tell you another heartbreaking story. On January 24th, 1988, a Sunday morning in Dana Point, California, Janet Overton, aged 46, began her day with breakfast at her residence. She and her 18-year-old son, Eric, were preparing for an outing they had planned with friends to go whale watching aboard a boat. As they loaded their belongings into the car parked in the driveway, tragedy struck. Before Janet could even step into the car, she suddenly collapsed on the driveway. Eric, alarmed by the turn of events, urgently called out to his father, Richard Overton, who was inside the house at the time. Richard dialed 911 without delay, seeking emergency assistance. Janet was swiftly transported to the hospital, but tragically she was pronounced dead before reaching medical care. Janet Overton's untimely death left a profound impact on her community, family, and colleagues. As a respected school board leader, she had contributed significantly to her community. Living alongside her husband of 19 years, Richard and their son, Eric, Janet was a beloved and popular figure. Her sudden passing was met with shock and grief, leaving many people devastated. In the years preceding her death, Janet had battled illness, seeking answers from various doctors without success. Despite her efforts to uncover the cause of her health issues, the mystery persisted. The autopsy conducted following her death failed to provide a conclusive explanation. The cause of her demise remained unknown, and her death certificate bore the ambiguous classification of an unknown cause of death. Despite the lack of a clear explanation, no evidence of foul play was discovered. Richard told police that he loved his wife dearly and she would be greatly missed. Her death seemed to be a complete mystery. Although investigators initially dismissed any nefarious involvement in Janet's death, one woman harbored doubts and decided to alert the police about her suspicions six months later. Dorothy Boyer believed that a closer examination of Janet's case was warranted, citing her knowledge of Richard's potential actions. According to Dorothy, Richard had allegedly attempted to lethally poison her through a gradual process. Dorothy recounted that she had been married to Richard two decades earlier, initially believing their marriage was content until she uncovered his double life. Despite cohabiting with Dorothy and their four children, Richard maintained a second residence where he spent time with another woman named Caroline Hutchison. Unbeknownst to Dorothy, Richard had married Caroline and started a family with her. Learning of Richard's deception, Dorothy initiated divorce proceedings. Following the divorce settlement in 1969, Dorothy retained ownership of the family home and continued to reside there. Richard, Resentful of the divorce, remained in the family home against Dorothy's wishes. Coinciding with the finalization of the divorce, Janet fell ill, experiencing persistent nausea and painful lesions on her body. On one occasion when Richard was present at the house, Janet detected an unusual odor emanating from her milk and suspected Richard of tampering with her drink. Dorothy presented the milk to the authorities, urging them to investigate leading to the revelation of a significant amount of selenium present, a substance known for its lethal potential in large doses. Confronted by the police, Richard admitted to lacing Dorothy's food and beverages with selenium following their divorce. He agreed to undergo psychological counseling, prompting Dorothy to refrain from pressing charges. However, upon learning of Janet's demise, Dorothy grew concerned that Richard might have been involved and decided to disclose all relevant information to the authorities, including tangible evidence. During a visit to the Overton's residence after Janet's passing, Dorothy discovered items in Richard's possession, including a woman's eyeliner, rubber gloves, an electronic device containing selenium, and a syringe, which she promptly handed over to the police. Subsequent tests confirmed the presence of selenium in the eyeliner. Armed with this new evidence, the police reopened their investigation into Janet's death. Recognizing the parallels between Janet's symptoms and Dorothy's own experiences post-divorce, authorities began to reassess the circumstances surrounding Janet's demise. Symptoms such as nausea, mobility issues, painful sores and rashes, 
and discolored feet mirrored those exhibited by Dorothy after her separation from Richard. Police acknowledged Dorothy's account, but recognized the disparities in circumstances between her poisoning and Janet's case. While Richard allegedly poisoned Dorothy out of anger following their divorce, he maintained that his marriage to Janet was harmonious with no issues. Thus, investigators faced the task of determining whether Janet had indeed been poisoned and if Richard was responsible. Unable to exhume Janet's body due to her cremation, authorities had to rely on existing evidence. Tests conducted on samples of Janet's tissue yielded no traces of selenium. Consequently, police enlisted the expertise of Paul Sedgwick, a retired coroner's toxicologist from the Orange County Sheriff's Department, to scrutinize Janet's stomach contents for signs of foul play. Paul detected the presence of cyanide upon examination, indicating that Janet had ingested it shortly before her death. Furthermore, traces of cyanide were discovered in her brain tissue, suggesting previous ingestion. The chief forensic toxicologist for the coroner's office, Robert H. Cravey, revealed that cyanide or selenium weren't initially tested for during the autopsy process unless there were suspicions raised by investigators or if the examiner was familiar with the smell of cyanide, as in Paul's case, prompting specific testing. He emphasized that the ability to detect the odor of cyanide is genetic, meaning not everyone possesses it. Robert elaborated on this variability, stating, the ability to smell cyanide is genetic. Not everyone can perceive its odor. With the identification of cyanide as the cause of Janet's death, the focus shifted to determining how she could have been exposed to it. Investigators uncovered that Richard had a connection to a friend involved in gold mining, granting him access to cyanide and other metallurgical materials stored at his friend's residence. Armed with this information, authorities obtained a search warrant for Richard's house to search for cyanide and selenium. During the search of Richard's residence, authorities seized his journals and computer uncovering deleted files that shed light on his true sentiments toward Janet and their marriage. Contrary to Richard's assertions of marital bliss, the journal entries painted a picture of a deeply strained relationship. Despite cohabiting, Richard and Janet led largely separate lives with no shared sleeping or dining arrangements. In fact, Richard's writings revealed a growing animosity towards Janet, with his affection transforming into outright hatred expressing his intention to deal with the situation imminently. Richard meticulously documented Janet's daily activities in his journal, including his suspicions of her alleged infidelities with multiple men, notably highlighting his disdain for an individual named Bill Dawson. Notably, Janet had plans for a whale-watching excursion with Bill and her son Eric on the day of her demise, yet the journal entry for January 24th, the day of her death, had been conspicuously removed. Further investigation unveiled Richard's disturbing actions, including his distribution of notes implicating Janet in an extramarital affair with a school official, a distressing incident that caused Janet considerable anguish as she initially grappled with the anonymous accusation plastered on cars at the district office where she served as a board member. Police interviewed some of Janet's friends, who revealed that she and Richard were starkly different individuals. Richard, a college lecturer and mathematician holding a doctorate in psychology as well as a business consultant, prioritized status and lacked Janet's vivacious, altruistic nature. Janet, known for her outgoing personality and dedication to helping others, cherished her independence. Initially drawn together by a shared interest in computers, their marriage of 19 years began to show signs of strain, as evidenced by Richard's journal entries, pointing towards an inevitable divorce. Despite the deteriorating relationship, Janet was hesitant to initiate divorce proceedings due to her reluctance to part with a portion of the $100,000 inheritance she had received from her mother's estate. However, Richard was eventually arrested and charged with first-degree murder in connection with Janet's death. He maintained his innocence throughout the trial, during which it was revealed that he was married to his fourth wife, Carol Townsend. 
During Richard's trial, he took the stand after seven weeks, enduring a two-day cross-examination by the prosecutor. His testimony was particularly challenging as he faced probing questions regarding his previous actions toward his ex-wife, Dorothy. Richard confessed to having placed prescription drugs in Dorothy's coffee in the past, claiming it was meant as a jest due to his perception of her mistreatment of their children. However, he vehemently denied replicating similar actions with Janet. On the third day of cross-examination, Richard suddenly complained of chest pains and dizziness in court, necessitating his removal on a gurney and a subsequent recess. The trial was halted, and after two months, the defense requested a further postponement, citing the health issues of Richard's lawyer, Robert D. Chatterton, who was clinically depressed. Concerns arose regarding the adequacy of the defense in light of Chatterton's condition. Eventually, the 4th District Court of Appeal in Santa Ana declared a mistrial due to the extraordinary delay of over six months between the prosecution and defense cases. The court cited the likelihood of jurors' attitudes becoming fixed during the prolonged recess. Subsequently, a new trial commenced with a fresh jury impaneled. In the prosecution's case against Richard, they alleged that he murdered Janet by administering lethal doses of selenium and cyanide over a prolonged period, ultimately culminating in her death. They contended that on the day Janet died, Richard spiked her orange juice with cyanide before she departed the house in the morning. The jury learned that the cause of death was revised from natural causes to acute cyanide intoxication following further testing, prompted by Dorothy's report to the police. Prosecutors argued that Richard possessed the means, motive, and opportunity to kill Janet. They pointed out his access to cyanide and highlighted entries in his journals expressing intense anger and hatred towards Janet, alongside the deterioration of their marriage. According to the prosecution, this animosity drove Richard to poison Janet with selenium and cyanide, administering it through various means such as her eyeliner and food and beverages, resulting in her illness and eventual demise. During the trial, it was revealed that in the years leading up to her death, Janet exhibited symptoms consistent with poisoning, although this was only evident in hindsight. Her symptoms mirrored those experienced by Dorothy, indicating a pattern of toxicity. Janet suffered from dehydration and excruciating lesions, making even the slightest contact with clothing unbearable. Additionally, she struggled to walk and relied on crutches for assistance. Despite seeking medical assistance from her physician and multiple specialists, Janet's condition remained unexplained. She sought treatment at the Scripps Clinic and Research Foundation in La Jolla on two occasions, yet doctors there were unable to provide a diagnosis. Janet was left bewildered and without answers regarding the rapid deterioration of her health. The prosecution argued that Janet's symptoms were indicative of selenium poisoning, aligning with their case against Richard. During the trial, the jury was presented with the contents of Richard's journals, discovered at his residence by the police. These journals meticulously documented Janet's activities, speculated about her alleged affairs, and disturbingly hinted at a campaign of slow poisoning using selenium. Notably, the journals were written in both Russian and Spanish. The prosecution emphasized to the jury that Richard's journals provided damning evidence against him, urging them to conclude that there was no other plausible explanation for Janet's death than murder by cyanide poisoning. Testimony from Janet's friends corroborated the assertion that she had no inclination toward self-harm. Moreover, her anticipation of presenting her son's diploma at school underscored her enthusiasm for life, a joy tragically cut short by her untimely demise. During the trial, the defense vehemently asserted Richard's innocence, challenging the prosecution's assertion that Janet's death was caused by cyanide poisoning. They argued that the level of cyanide detected in Janet's system was too low to be lethal and could potentially have been a byproduct of ulcer medication she was taking at the time, with traces of cyanide found in her prescription medication. The defense contended that the presence of cyanide in Janet's system could have developed in tissue post-mortem. In response, the prosecution called upon experts to refute the defense's claims, 
asserting that the low levels of cyanide detected were consistent with natural dissipation over time rather than post-mortem development. However, the defense dismissed this argument, deeming it irrelevant due to the lack of concrete evidence linking cyanide poisoning to Janet's death. They proposed that Janet's poor health and pre-existing heart condition were more likely causes of death rather than cyanide poisoning. Richard's defense lawyer, George A. Peters, emphasized Richard's concern for Janet's deteriorating health despite his anger upon discovering her affairs, suggesting that his primary focus was her well-being. Richard was found guilty of murder in the first degree. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole due to the special circumstance in the case, namely that he killed Janet by poisoning her. Richard told the court that he was an innocent man. The truth is, I am innocent. The truth is, I never poisoned John Overton with anything at any time in any manner, ever. I don't know what I can do. I'll pray and I'll do what I can to help the truth shine through the clouds. Richard continued to maintain his innocence until his death in 2009. He died at the age of 81 due to advanced dementia and complications of diabetes. He died at a hospice in Northern California after he had been transferred from Folsom State Prison where he was still incarcerated. His fourth wife, Carol Townsend, believed that he was an innocent man. He was a wonderful man. He was a brilliant man. He did not kill his wife. She died of natural causes. The prosecution was overly aggressive and put out a lot of innuendo, and the defense swallowed it up. What do you think of today's story? Write your opinion about this case in the comments. I thank you for your attention and recommend subscribing to the channel as well as clicking on the bell to not miss new videos that are released daily. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. See you soon.